Thank you so much for joining us for Bible study today. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful again for this beautiful season of spring that has sprung upon us. The promise of hope, the new life, the seeds that are planted in the ground that bring forth the, the vegetables and the fruits of the season. We give you thanks for blessing us with your new life and pray that you would continue to help us look forward as we anticipate the celebration of that Resurrection Day, which is just around the corner. We just give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been following along during this season of Lent, we've actually been taking a look at emotions. Okay? Emotions. And I have made a claim. First of all, let me start with this. There are, at least according to psychologists, no less than eight or nine base emotions that motivate every single human being and are inside of us. Now, today there's actually some thought that this might be upwards of 60 some different emotions that they're able to distinguish, but we're going to go with the baseline of these eight to nine, which seem to, you know, these other 60 or so all seem to be based on these. And these are things like anger, you know, we have, we have love. Love is, believe it or not, one of the debated ones. Like, is that a distinct emotion or is that a social construct that we fall in love with people? Well, it is a motivating thing for us in life. And then we also have some other things like fear. If you missed out on my thing on fear last week, I hope you go and take the opportunity to watch the sermon, okay? I am going to post just the sermon on Facebook. I'm also going to post it on our YouTube channel in case you really don't want to have to go through and watch the entire worship service in which I preach this sermon. But this has really been misunderstood by Christians. I really, really need you to watch this because a lot of Christians have used fear as a club against Christians. You're not allowed to fear. That's a sin. Blah, 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 blah. They don't know what the heck they're talking about. God says never fear. That's not true, by the way. There's always a particular circumstance in which we are not supposed to fear. However, it's not an indictment of fear in general. In fact, the Bible says that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was crying tears of blood, and it uses the word he was terrified of facing the cross. So obviously our understanding of fear that is somehow sin and wrong is absolutely wrong, okay? I'm here to contend that of these emotions, including anger and love and fear and all of them, are creations of God for a purpose of helping us face the challenges in life. They supercharge us with emotions so we can face the hard things. God created emotions for that purpose. It is also, if we take a look at love, actually a more positive way, that we take risk and invest ourselves. We might be afraid of love. We might be afraid of being hurt. Love helps us invest in the lives of others. So it is my contention that every emotion is a creation of God, and the Bible demonstrates every single one of these emotions in a positive light. Now, they can be used destructively, but they can also be used constructively as God intended. Today, I'll lie. Hang tight. Got to have an eraser. So today, we are looking at a fear that is contained in the book of Amos that you bet, I bet you don't even think is, you would never, ever think that a Christian should ever have this emotion. Disgust. It seems like such a pejorative emotion, doesn't it? Well, let me, let me tell you what disgust is. Disgust is a feeling of revulsion or disapproval. We perceive disgust through our physical senses, senses, sight and sound and smell and touch, or by the actions and appearances and behaviors of people. Okay? So, I believe that disgust, my claim, is the creation of God to protect us. Now, I think there are many things that, uh, by which we are disgusted. 
that are social in nature and we just have to overcome those things. Sometimes they're cultural disgust. We don't like what other cultures eat. You know, there were, I remember I was a butcher uh, at a butcher, I was a butcher at, uh, in Minnesota when I was uh, in seminary. And, you know, there are many cultures that ate many different things. We had people who would come to us and, and want cow brain or cow tongue, not typically things that most Westerners appreciate or enjoy. But for them, it was quite a delicacy. Even my mentioning that to you might disgust you. That's a cultural thing. You have to overcome that, okay? So there are cultural things that are discussed. There are other things and other things of which we're disgusted that are pretty obvious why we're disgusted. And that disgust is meant to protect us. So, for instance, human refuse, feces, is a disgusting thing. You know, and, uh, you know, back in the old days, they would take their urine and their feces and dump it out the door and there in the middle of the streets. And, and then we had the Black Plague and all sorts of diseases that were a result of this, right? Well, we're disgusted for it for a reason, to protect ourselves. So maybe if we'd taken that disgust and put it out and buried it in the woods or whatever it was, we would have saved ourselves a great deal of trouble. Disgust is meant to protect us from those types of things. We're revolted by that for a reason, okay? So disgust is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not inherently a bad thing, as long as it's not because of social biases towards others. I'm here to contend that God was disgusted by our behavior. And I can tell you for a fact there are many behaviors for which we should be disgusted. And we're going to learn about some of those in the book of Amos today. So let's take a look at what disgusts God. Maybe I'll keep this up here just so we keep in mind that's what we're talking about. There are things that revolt God to God's very core because they war against the very nature of how God created us to be. And we see this evidently clear in the book of Amos chapter 1. So the prophet Isaiah is listing, as, is speaking for God, I guess, and saying that God is, is disgusted by certain things, and God is judging Israel and judging all the nations around. So first he starts with all the nations surrounding Israel, and of course Israel saying, yeah, that person's disgusting. Yeah, that person's offensive. Yeah, that person's offensive. But see, what happens is the prophet keeps narrowing and narrowing the noose until it's around the neck of Israel itself, and then all of a sudden he drops it. You too have disgusted God by your behavior. But let's take a look at what disgusts God. The very first thing, and we're going to go through this relatively quickly. I encourage you to read it yourself. I'm not going to read everything. But he starts with a country called Damascus. And so Damascus, and I, I, I won't have time to list out all of these things, but Damascus is a close neighbor, relatively close neighbor of Israel. And he talks about, for three transgressions of death, Damascus, and for four, I will not revoke my punishment because they have threshed Gilead with sl threshing sledges of iron. They've had wanton destruction. Huh, do we see this going on right now? Oh my gosh, maybe Ukraine? Anybody? Want destruction taking place by Russia against Ukraine for absolutely no good or constructive reason? I mean, is there ever really a reason that's constructive to go to war? I don't know. So these folks are just one destruction of their next door neighbors. And he goes on, he talks about, uh, let's take a look. Ooh. My Bible is freezing here on me, folks. Uh, he goes on to verse 6. That's verse 3. So verse 6. In verse 6, he talks about um, Gaza. For th four transgressions, I will not revoke my punishment because they have carried into exile entire communities to hand them over to Edom. So what's he talking about? Slavery. 
They've enslaved peoples, whole peoples, for a really disgusting reason and purpose. Okay? For money. Alright? For money, they've done this. He goes on, oh, we're not done. Verse 9, he talks about another community, Tyre. You've heard of that, that God is upset and disgusted by them once again for the same reason, for slavery, for money. They've kidnapped people, he says. They've delivered entire communities to Edom and did not remember their covenant of kinship. So they just said, you know, I don't care if you're related to me. I'm going to make a profit at your expense. Oh, sorry, stinks to be you. Oh, verse 11, he goes on about Edom. Edom, I will not revoke my punishment because you have pursued your brothers with sword and cast off all pity. They have no pity. They've committed murder. In fact, genocide in this case against their neighbor. And they have no pity on them. They just continue to oppress them with that wanton destruction. We're getting a theme here. I hope you're seeing this. Verse 13, again, another genocide against the Ammonites. They have ripped open pregnant women and Gilead in order to enlarge their territory. Okay? In other words, they have destroyed the babies before they were born. Please, this is, this is not about abortion. Okay? There are other, this is not, you know, I've heard some Christians use this as a statement against abortion. This is not about, this is about them literally wanting to commit genocide against the people, and they kill babies before they're born in order to do so. Okay. Um, no, I'm not saying that there aren't arguments. You know, obviously we as Christians um, need to talk about these types of social behaviors, about abortion and so forth. But that's not the purpose of this lesson here today. It's about the genocide that they have committed against these people. And it's just showing how disgusting this is. Oh, we go on. Uh, on to the next chapter, chapter 2. Uh, Moab. They have devoured the strongholds of Kerioth and Moab. Amidst midroar, they've cut off the rulers from their midst. And he goes on and says, uh, they have rejected the law of the Lord. Um, they've burned to, the li uh, to lime the bones of the king of Edom. That's verse 1 about Moab. I was getting ahead of myself. So in other words, they were disrespecting the dead. They were displacing, because this is really what this is about. They were displacing whole peoples from their territory. Hmm. Who did that? Disrespecting the dead. Every time we out of capitalistic impulses, let me see, uh, dig up Native American burial grounds? Wouldn't that be exactly what's taking place here? Because we want to make a profit. And yet we have Natives, who Americans, who are saying, this is where our ancestors are buried. We are committing the same injustice that is being talked about here in the Old Testament. Oh, but it's for a profit. It's for money. It's going to benefit all these people. But you're displacing the dead. You've taken away the territory and land of people to whom it has belonged for millennia. This is what they're talking about. Okay? I'm trying to make this real. That's an injustice, and God is disgusted by this. Again, now he turns his attention to Judah, and that's what I started to read, kind of mixed that up a little bit, because they have rejected God's law. Now, this is more generic. What does that mean, rejected God's law? He's going to go on and explain that in just a minute. Judah, of course, is the smaller of the two nations of Israel. Remember, Israel divided into two countries, the northern tribes of Israel, the southern tribes called Judah, and so forth. But then he goes on to talk about Israel itself. He says, for this is verse 6, for three transgressions of Israel, for four, I will not revoke my punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver, the needy for a pair of sandals, they trample the head of the poor into dust of the earth, and they push the afflicted out of the way, Father and son go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. Oh my goodness. 
In other words, Israel has committed all of these sins. What have they done again? They sold people into slavery for money, right? They have trampled on the poor, pushed them away for a profit. They have denied justice to the oppressed, to the at risk. And when we talk about this sexual deviant, sexual violence, let's put it this way it is. Sexual violence against women for men's own pleasure. This is what the Bible is talking about. These are social injustices, larger picture injustices, okay? Social injustices. See, here's the thing. When we talk about sin in our culture today, especially we Christians, we, we, we personalize sin. It's all about my personal behavior against you, and as long as I act kindly towards you, that's fine. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, if we want a true biblical uh, view of what sin is, almost invariably it has to do with social behaviors that we as a society do or allow to be done without confronting it. Slavery, trampling on the poor, denying justice, sexual violence against women. We allow these things as a society to go on. This is the sin that the Bible, if you want to know what sin is in the Bible, this is what sin is. We tend to too, too much make it just a personal me and Jesus thing. Remember, it's Jesus and us. We are a community. And when we as a community allow these types of injustices to continue, we carry a collective guilt according to the Bible. Oh, I know there are a lot of Christians in the United States of America who don't like this idea of collective guilt. Sorry, we are guilty. You know, we get very offended by this. Well, my family didn't have any slaves. I'm not guilty. Did your family stand up to slavery? If it didn't, you're just as guilty as the slaveholders. We lionize rich people. Okay, listen to this. Listen to this. Let's take a look at this about trampling on the poor. I'm not causing anybody to be poor. We have such a poor attitude about wealth and poverty in this United States of America. We lionize rich people. We all want to be rich people. Kind of like Tevye, if I were a rich man, right? We all want to be the rich. Sometimes we want to pay the price for it. And I'm not, you know, I, we all want to be wealthy. And I, there's nothing wrong with having some wealth. But oftentimes wealth is, is at the expense of the poor. Okay? We trample on the poor to get there. And what's our attitude? What's our attitude towards the poor? They're lazy. They brought this all on themselves. That's a very, that's, <laughs> that's a very pharisaical way to look at poverty. Oh, they brought this on themselves. Every time you look at a poor person and say, well, they caused their own problems, you are being a Pharisee. That's not Jesus' attitude. I will not deny that there are some people who are poor because of their own personal choices, without question. But for the most part, people who are poor are poor because of communal guilt. Why do you think people are poor in India? Do you think they're poor because they all made a choice and they're lazy? They're poor because there are social pressures and social injustices that prevent poor people from ever being set free from this bondage of poverty. They can't pick themselves up by their own bootstraps because society is structured in a way that prevents that. Even in our country, our society is structured in a way that makes it very difficult, not impossible, but incredibly difficult for poor people 
to be delivered out of their poverty. These are social injustices that the Bible talks about as being wrong, and we carry the guilt, the collective guilt of this. When God gets disgusted, it's by how we treat women, by how we deny justice to the poor, and we make a profit on the backs of the people who are disadvantaged. That's what disgusts God. Okay? And so I do think that we need to come to a season of repentance during the season of Lent. We've allowed this to go on by lionizing wealth and diminishing people who are poor by labeling them as just lazy butts who need to get off their rear ends because my family did okay. Well, good for you. Those are anecdotal circumstances where maybe an individual is able to work hard and get themselves out of poverty, but there are other people who may not have those skills that you had, or the fortune, or the support that you had to find your family delivered out of poverty. We, as, a, as people of God, need to make it possible for people to be delivered out of poverty, and we cannot contribute to this. Sexual violence, injustice to the poor, making a profit at the back and the expense of the disadvantaged. God is disgusted by these things. We have contributed by these things directly or by not speaking up against them. I know these things make us uncomfortable, don't they? I just want to end with this. I am not advocating for a particular political perspective because these things touch upon these things right wing, left wing, blah, blah, blah. I think you're both, we both can be a little bit crazy and wrong here, okay? Certainly, sometimes uh, folks on one side deny that there is any social culpability for the injustice that happens in society. It's not my fault. I don't create it. We are all guilty and create the situation by not speaking up, by not doing what we're called to do. And then, of course, there's other folks who say, well, I just pass a law, and whatever law is for the poor, it's got to be good. Just because you say you're passing laws for the good doesn't mean you're working for the poor. Okay? That's just ridiculous. There are a lot of laws that are passed, supposedly in the name of poor, that only enrich rich people. They don't do anything for the poor. So you don't get off the hook. Sorry. We need to take a serious look about our attitude towards poverty, injustices, violence against women. For these are the things that disgust God and they should also disgust us. Let us pray. Oh my goodness, God, this is a tough lesson. As we are confronted by our own failure to confront poverty and injustice and, 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 so, and, and sexual violence against women. We do carry this guilt, God. We live in a very wealthy society and it's easy because we're so distant sometimes. It's kind of, you know, we're just so distant from um, the mechanisms that create this poverty and we kind of delude ourselves in thinking we're not a part of it but by the purchases we make, by not speaking out, by the things that we have done and things we have left undone, God. Help us to be more concerned about the plight of those who are poor, about the injustices done to those who are at risk. For certainly justice is better in this country for people who are rich and can afford it than for those who are poor. Well, there's something wrong with the justice like that. There's something wrong with a society that treats women as lesser than. We just ask you to free us from these things and help us to be more conscientious about what we need to do collectively. That these injustices might not be done. For you ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I've, I've dumped a heavy burden on you today. 
I'm not sure I've got all of the answers to this. But I do need to, I do claim that we need to keep these things in our hearts and in front of our faces because this is the concern of Jesus who had a heart for the poor and those who were at risk. So I'm inviting you today to have a heart for the poor, a heart for those at risk. My God sent you forth to be a messenger of good news to all those who are hurting. For he asks this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.